I'd like to introduce Dr. Gerard Younger, PhD from the United States. Good morning, Gerard. Good morning. Could you tell us first a bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. I am uh, originally trained as an experimental psychologist, and I was trained as a health psychologist, which means I do research on uh, psychological therapies and pharmaceutical therapies for various conditions. I'm now an assistant professor at Stanford University in the uh, Division of Pain Medicine. Mm -hmm. And how did you first find out about LDN? I originally heard about LDN off of the Internet. So the first thing I heard was from the Internet, and it was, I can't remember the exact site now, but it was kind of a uh, not-for-profit site that was just basically talking about individuals' experiences with LDN. And I didn't think too much about it at the time, um, but then I ran across some scientific studies by basic scientists where they were looking at uh, mice models, and they found that giving naltrexone was reducing inflammation in the brain. So when I read that second part, I put the two together and thought, well, there may be something to this LDN, so I might as well uh, give it a try for fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And you've also done some studies, I understand. Yeah, so we, our first study was published in 2009, and that was a very small pilot trial because, you know, we don't want to invest a large amount of money until we've got a pretty good indication that something is going to work. So we ran that on 10 individuals, 10 women with fibromyalgia, and had a very good response to the treatment. It was placebo-controlled, so everyone received placebo and everyone received the treatment as well. Um, and they did significantly better when they were on the LDN. And the, the best part was the side effects were very, very minimal. So, you know, a few people said they had more vivid dreams, but that was the worst of it. So we had a really good response to that first study. So we then, we've collected 30 more individuals. And we actually finished data collection about a year ago, um, but I'm still just now wrapping up the analyses. So those are going to be reviewed probably in the next month and should be published in three months or so from now. Mm -hmm. So where do you see LDN going? Um, well, where I'm going to take it is, you know, so far I've used it for fibromyalgia. Where I'm testing it next is on pediatric fibromyalgia. There's actually a, a lot more children with fibromyalgia than most people realize. And the problem is because they have a developing brain, we don't want to hit them with really hardcore drugs that could mess up neural development. So I think LDN is going to be, uh, you know, potentially excellent uh, treatment course for children because it seems to be so easily tolerated. So definitely pediatric cases of fibromyalgia. I'm also testing it on um, Gulf War illness, which are veterans who uh, seem to have chronic pain and fatigue. It seems a lot like fibromyalgia, so I'm going to test it on them as well. And then I think ultimately where I hope to see it go, and we haven't tested this yet, but really any condition where there could be inflammation in the central nervous system, kind of a, a low-level autoimmune condition, it could explain some cases of depression, um, definitely a lot of conditions where people are feeling fatigue, so chronic fatigue syndrome, different pain conditions. And I think a lot of these may actually be helped to some degree with, with LDN. So, you know, I kind of see it as a, a kind of like how we take aspirin right now for inflammation in the body. I see it as potentially being aspirin for the brain, something that can cross the blood-brain barrier and calm down inflammation in the central nervous system, which could help a, a lot of different conditions. I mean, are you able to tell us how you think LDN works? Yeah, I... The the theory that I'm working on is a little bit different than the one that most people um, kind of talk about because I think the most common hypothesis is that the LDN blocks endogenous opioids for a little bit of time so there's a rebound in the opioids and that causes its effects. I, I'm not sure that's the major cause of the beneficial um, response. What I believe is happening is there are... Uh, immune system cells in the brain called microglia, and those cells are normally floating around, and they're normally looking for problems, and if there's a virus, 
they'll help fight that off, and they basically protect the brain from damage. One of the side effects, when they become activated, they release cytokines that make people feel sick. And they can actually, if they're around too long, they can start to destroy neurons. So they're neurodegenerative. Um, an example is if, if you get the flu and you feel really horrible and sick and you don't want to do anything, you just want to lay in bed, that's actually caused by your own immune system. The microglia are producing chemicals that make you feel sick. And the reason they do that is to get you in bed so your body can devote all of its resources to fight off the infection. But what we think in a lot of conditions is these microglia have become chronically activated. They're producing these cytokines in the brain and they're causing um, fatigue and chronic pain and, and other conditions. And so I think that lotus naltrexone um, can block those microglia from producing the cytokines. It essentially calms them back down. And that can happen in the brain. It can also happen in the spinal cord. And so it's keeping microglia from producing the chemicals that can destroy neurons and, and cause lesions or, or cause uh, pain and fatigue and flu-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. Some people have started doing double dosing. What would you mm -hmm. think to that? You know, I can only speak to things that we've directly tested in the lab because I don't see patients outside of a research protocol. Mm -hmm. I have less flexibility to try different dosing schedules. Our, the way I currently approach the dosing is if you get too high, now remember naltrexone was originally formulated to completely block opioid receptors. And for a lot of conditions, that's something you don't want to do. So in fibromyalgia, which is a pain condition, if you block the opioid receptors, you've basically blocked endogenous opioids. So you've blocked the body's ability to reduce pain. So that's why we don't give the full amount. So the danger is as you get higher and higher with the dosage, you get closer to that point at which you're going to actually antagonize natural pain killing uh, systems, which we don't want to do. So that's why it's at 4.5. I just don't know what that upper limit is and, and what point it actually becomes um, counterproductive. We, we've only tested 4.5 and we've gone down to three occasionally if someone had side effects, but we've never gone up past 4.5. Now, I'm working with some new researchers who are experts at computer systems that can determine the optimal dose. So basically, you take a dose, you record how you feel, the computer takes that and then changes the dose a little bit. So you try a new dose and it figures out for that individual what their best dosage is. And so that may be something we, we employ for LDN to see if maybe for some people a higher dosage may work just fine, but we haven't tested it yet. Some of the things that have come up, um, you know, I get a, well, I probably get a email or a call about lotus naltrexone at least twice a day. So a very steady kind of slew of questions about this. One of the most common questions, um, a lot of people are trying to make the LDN themselves. Uh, I know they're taking the full 50 milligram tablets and they're trying to dissolve that in liquid and then divide out the liquid. And, you know, I understand that, that people are probably doing that because it's very difficult to get a hold of the compounded 4.5 milligrams. Um, but if people can go through a legitimate route, if there's any way to do that, I, I highly recommend that because it is very hard to dose these things yourself and to come up with, with the right dosage in each, uh, each capsule or each kind of little liquid vial that you're trying to make. So uh, there's some danger, not that it's probably going to cause any physical harm, but it's, it's tough to, uh, to divide it out yourself. So I generally advise people to try not to do that if they can avoid it. People have asked about a lot of different conditions, whether it works for arthritis, and I've been asked if it works for asthma, if it works for cancer. And, you know, my general answer to those is it's any of these things are possible, but the only way we know for sure is if we directly test it in an experimental protocol. So I always have to tell people that there's just no way to know. Um, you know, it could help rheumatoid arthritis because, of course, there's a strong autoimmune element to rheumatoid arthritis. But 
we have to test it first. So there's all these potential conditions that could be greatly helped. And it may, as I mentioned before, it may expand to depression. It could help psychological disorders. It, you know, we already know that it's helping with Crohn's disease, so gastrointestinal inflammation. A lot of potential conditions that could be helped. But, you know, each one of those require their own study. So I think we need more people who are trying LDN with other uh, other conditions, that would be helpful. Uh, let's see. Another thing is I'm already starting to try to look at if we know how LDN works, is there a way we can optimize the treatment? And this is something I probably mentioned uh, a year ago, but the progress is very slow in this regard. Naltrexone has two halves. It has a, a left side and a right side. The... Um, the left side is responsible for blocking opioids, and the right side, which we call dextro, dextronaltrexone, is responsible for blocking the microglia. So there's actually a compound where we just take the half of the naltrexone that seems to be having the positive effect, and if we could give that to people, we might actually be able to increase the dosage and increase the efficacy without increasing side effects. So one of the potentially new exciting things that could come in the next few years is an optimized form of naltrexone, which would be called dextronaltrexone, which could be given to people and would work very much the same way, but maybe even more potent, which would be very exciting. The problem is that it's only available for animals right now, and it takes so much money to go through the uh, regulatory process to get that okayed for human consumption. And is it easy to get people to work with you on LDN over there? Uh, you know, you have to find people who are open. If they're, you know, trained in the classic kind of medical allopathic uh, system, then they're very skeptical of lotus naltrexone. Um, but most people uh, recently coming out of medical school seem to be very open-minded. And now there's enough literature where you can convince people that this is something worth looking at. So um, I haven't tried to convert researchers over to low-dose naltrexone, but I, I'm sure to mention it every time I can. And I'm starting to get interest from people, and they're willing to put some of their time behind researching it themselves. Sure, Lovely. of and, and thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. No problem. Hope it helps. <laughs> okay. I'll keep you in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. All right. Bye-bye.